Okay, welcome to the last day of Chemistry 202 uh, Reaction Mechanisms. I'm sorry I'm going to do a PowerPoint presentation. We just have a little bit more material than I can cover in a, in a whiteboard lecture. And so the last lecture, we mainly talked about the structure and reactivity of radicals, how to predict that based on bond dissociation energies, what kinds of feature of molecules can stabilize uh, radicals, uh, especially on carbon, that's what we're mainly interested in. And uh, so let's go ahead and talk about reactions of radicals today. I don't know how to get rid of this little box on the bottom here. X will do that. Uh, let's try this. Yeah, okay, there we go. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> one of the principal reactions of radicals that you learn in, in every sophomore organic chemistry class is the replacement of hydrogen atoms with bromine atoms, and you typically do this with bromine or with sources of bromine, Br2. So uh, for benzylic positions, that's the most useful version of this reaction. You can also replace allylic hydrogens with bromine. The problem is there's very little control over regiochemistry in those reactions. So uh, most likely your exposure to this reaction will come through benzylic bromination. And so at some point in the reaction, you're going to have Br dot floating around, and the bromine radical will abstract a hydrogen atom from this weak CH bond at the benzylic position to make a resonance stabilized benzylic radical like you see right here. And then that benzylic radical can abstract a bromine atom off of Br2. And so you end up with a new carbon bromine bond. And so it's a very simple reaction. Uh, but when you look at the steps that are involved in this process, it's a little bit more complex. Something has to generate this Br dot that you initially start with here at the beginning. So let's take a look at those steps. So every radical reaction or radical chain reaction that we're going to talk about has some sort of way of getting the reaction started, of generating the key propagating species, which in this case is Br dot. And so one of the common ways to initiate radical reactions is to throw in something that has a weak heteroatom heteroatom bond. Um, and so a common initi initiator of radical reactions is peroxides. Oxygen, oxygen bonds are weak. It's very easy to homolyze those. Benzoyl peroxide is the most common radical initiator that you find that involves oxygen, oxygen bonds. This is the same stuff you smear on your face for, for acne. Acne creams are 10, 5 to 10 percent benzoyl peroxide. And so when you heat this up, it homolyzes to give oxygen-based radicals. And of course, oxygen is electronegative. It wants eight electrons. So oxygen radicals are usually very aggressive. Um, and so in this case, it'll easily pluck off a hydrogen atom from a benzylic position in order to get this reaction going. And so once you generate the benzylic radical, that sets this whole chain process in motion. So the benzylic radical abstracts bromine, and there's your benzylic bromine bond. Uh, and then that regenerates your Br dot, which continues the radical chain process. So that's a radical chain mechanism. Um, very useful for if you want to put a leaving group at a benzylic position. Um, quite often, for if you want to do allylic bromination, abstract hydrogen atoms off of allylic positions to make stable allyl radicals, uh, you have to use a different reagent. You can't just use Br2 anymore. And so you use n bromosuccinamide, this, this secret reagent here. And the whole point of n bromosuccinamide, NBS, in this reaction is to serve as a source of a low concentration of Br2. And so as soon as these reactions get going, you start to build up HBr in the reaction. The Br2 splits apart. One bromine goes to the carbon substrate. The other bromine picks up the hydrogen atom and generates HBr. And that HBr, or any catalyst really, uh, acid catalyst, catalyzes this reaction where you can imagine protonating here. And now it becomes very easy for Br- to, to attack bromine and generate Br2 in the reaction. And so you generate this very low steady state concentration of bromine. And the reason why that's ideal is your reaction contains double bonds. If you're doing allylic bromination, your reaction will contain alkene starting materials, alkenes in the product, and you do not want your alkenes simply getting brominated by the Br2. So you want to keep the, the concentrations of Br2 low so that you don't end up with addition of bromine across, the, uh, across that bromine, uh, across that CC double bond. And that's only an issue if you do uh, allylic bromination. So for benzylic bromination where you don't have reactive double bonds, you can use Br2 or NBS, um, whichever one you choose. Okay, so when you think about radical reactions, you have to think about oxygen. 
In most cases, you want to exclude oxygen if you have reactions that involve radicals. Photochemical rea reactions, most of them involve radicals. Um, and so let's talk about oxygen and why that's such an issue. The oxygen that you're breathing right now, if you take a deep breath, you're just breathing in a sea of radicals. Right? That whole breath that you take in, you're breathing in oxygen, which in its ground state is a triplet. We normally don't draw radicals or electrons with their spin, but if I draw those two electrons on each oxygen atom and show the spin, you can see that they're not matched to form a double bond. There is no way that you can bring these two, rad these two electrons together and form a double bond because they have the same spin. You can't put two electrons with the same spin in any orbital. And so, <clears throat> if you really wanted to form a bond here, you'd have to have a singlet, and that's higher in energy. So singlet oxygen is not the stuff you're breathing right now, and it's a good thing because you would burst into flames, if that were true. Because this would do ene reactions with every double bond, every allylic hydrogen in your, in your fatty acids and lipids. It would do 4 plus 2 cyclization, cyclizations, all this stuff. Okay, so this is not what oxygen looks like. The oxygen you breathe is triplet oxygen, and it's a diradical. And it reacts like a radical. Now it's a stable radical, obviously. It must be stable if it exists in the air that we're breathing. But very, very, very slowly, you can initiate radical processes with ethers. Like the diethyl ether you use as a solvent in the lab. The THF you use as a solvent. Um, anything with weak CH bonds can, in theory, very slowly, slowly, slowly start off radical chain processes. And if you have some other source of radicals, it'll be even faster. But once you get this thing going, it's never going to stop. You'll have an infinite radical chain that sucks in oxygen from the atmosphere because this radical you generate now will very rapidly react with every oxygen molecule that it sees. I don't know how to fix this turning off thing. With every oxygen radical that it sees, that carbon radical is going to react. You know, of course, oxygen doesn't have an octet, wants an octet. Carbon radical here doesn't have an octet, and it wants an octet. So radical recombination with carbon, you should expect that to always be fast. And so once you, once you form a new carbon-oxygen bond here, this peroxy radical can now be the thing that abstracts the hydrogen atom from your next THF, THF molecule. And so this little reaction will just go and go and go and suck oxygen out of the atmosphere. And so the issue for you is if you have old, old bottles of ether in the lab, the issue is that these peroxides that you generate are less volatile than the ether you started with. So you have old bottles that have been slowly evaporating through the cap. It's the ether that evaporates, whereas the peroxides get concentrated more and more and more at the bottom until they turn into solids. The bottom line is when you concentrate peroxides, you just generate something that's more and more explosive. This is why they warn you in the lab not to allow bottles to sit of ethers to sit around for a long time. Um, because basically that has allowed the, the, the peroxides to concentrate in those bottles of ether. And if you ever see an old bottle of ether that has crystals on the, on the don't, don't mess with it. Um, those are ready to explode. Okay, so how do you stop auto-oxidation? That's this process of sucking in oxygen from the atmosphere to form peroxides. Well, what do you do to stop that? What you do is you add phenols. Phenols have very weak OH bonds because those radicals you generate are stabilized by resonance. And so it's very easy to, it's, in fact, it's easier to abstract an H atom off of a phenol, which is surprising because it gives you an oxygen-based radical, at least for one of the resonance structures. And here's two of the most common phenols that are used to inhibit radical reactions. When you throw these types of phenols uh, into solutions of ethers, they totally shut down autoxidation. They react with the oxygen-based radicals faster than the ether or your other susceptible system. Um, and so one common phenol is butylated hydroxytoluene. And the key here is they have T-butyl groups that prevent CC bond formation. One, some of the resonance structures you can draw for phenolic radicals put radicals here or here, and you don't want those to dimerize and shut down your phenol. Um, <clears throat> so as soon as you put phenols in your reaction, they will, will capture um, they will react with those radical species, and that, that leads to these stable radicals. And this is just too stable to pluck H atoms off at a reasonable rate off of any sort of ether molecule. And so it's okay if this builds up. It's not okay to have this radical in your solution. So this is why when you buy ethers from commercial suppliers, um, they always have this thing stabilized on there. 
So if you look at the bottles of ether that you buy, if you look at the cans of ether that you buy, diethyl ether or tetrahydrofuran, uh, they'll say something here like stabilizer, BHT. Right? Those are significant concentrations. You take a liter of stabilized ethers and they can have up to 400 milligrams per liter of BHT stabilizer. So you have to take that out. Right? You have to remove that stuff by distillation or running it through a drying column before you use this in your reactions or else you've got a phenolic OH floating around which can protonate species and stuff like that. Um, this is not some super special magic trick. Uh, if you go to every kind of food, you look at the package label, they're doing the same trick in there. So you read through the, the labels on your granola bar and suddenly you get to somewhere and, oh, what's this? BHT, they're throwing it in there. That's because the lipids, and we've got a problem on your problem set, that's because the lipids contain fatty acids with very susceptible CHs that are ready to form peroxides. This is why your food goes, gets stale and goes bad, is because it's building up peroxides. And so typically food companies add stabilizers like BHT to stop the formation of peroxides through autoxidation aut processes. Uh, here's a popular frozen pizza, and you can see they've added a mixture here of BHA and BHT to slow down these radical autoxidation processes. Um, there's a lot of organic chemistry in here, in these labels actually. I don't know about you, but I love to read labels and learn about organic chemistry. It just makes it seem more yummy to me. Okay, what does it take to make a really stable radical? If you go back to the history of radical chemistry, um, it certainly predates 1900, but this is the first time people realized that you can have radicals that are so stable that you can actually isolate them, or at least see them in solution. This is a very famous paper by Moses Gomberg at Michigan, who, who showed that when he treated, uh, you know, this is kind of like Grignard reagent formation. Uh, when you take low valent metals and you treat alkyl halides with that, especially if it can form a stable radical, in this case he showed that he got this dimer. And it wasn't the dimer he expected, where a Wurtz coupling, where you had two carbons at the trital positions, the, the methane carbon, bound together, because that would be too hindered. In fact, these form this very weird dimer where one of the bonds is to one of the benzene rings. Uh, but this, in solution, is in equilibrium. It is so hindered, and the resulting radical is so stable that it's actually in equilibrium with the radical. There's 2% in solution of this radical floating around. No matter what you do, you've got 2% of that trital radical floating around. This is one of the most famous papers in organic chemistry. Uh, because at the very last line of the paper he says uh, uh, something like studies are ongoing and I wish to reserve the field for myself. N nobody nowadays would have the hubris to claim a field for themselves because other people jump right on it and out publish you if you ever do that. Um, okay, so what does it take to really make a stable radical? If you really want to make a stable radical, you don't want to just have resonance groups on your radical system like this. What you really want to do if you want to have a super duper duper stable radical is you want to put a resonance acceptor on there and you also want to put a resonance donor. And just for good measure you can have another resonance acceptor or donor on there like a benzene ring. This radical is stable for days at room temperature. You can isolate that radical. It is so stable. So it's amazing that you can have carbon radicals that are that stable. So let's uh Let's talk about stable radicals again. So carbon radicals that are stable are pretty unusual. You need that captodative effect or lots of resonance to make uh, carbon-based radicals super stable. Uh, but oxygen is kind of magical. So here's an example of a type, type of radical called a nitroxide radical. And whereas carbon-based radicals usually dimerize very rapidly in order to satisfy the octet rule, if, if you dimerize an oxygen-based radical, you end up with a weak oxygen-oxygen bond. So Here's a radical that's stabilized by the nitrogen lone pair. And even though it's an oxygen-based radical, it doesn't dimerize uh, significantly because that would cause you to form this weak bond. You don't get anything out of that. So it turns out you can buy this particular radical called Tempo. It's got methyl groups here, so there's no alpha hydrogens next to the amine. Perfectly stable uh, commercial reagent. And when you throw this into reactions where you think you have alkyl radicals floating around as intermediates, it will rapidly form bonds with those radicals. That's a classical test to see if you have unstabilized radicals floating around in your reaction. You can use tempo as a trap to trap out those radical intermediates. Okay, so let's talk about uh, another type of radical reaction other than, uh, that's not just simple H atom abstraction. 
So not H substitution by bromine or peroxide formation. So radicals can also add across double bonds. So when you take sophomore organic chemistry, you learn about the difference between Markonikov versus anti-Markonikov addition across double bonds. And classically, reagents like HBr, HCl, or thiols add in an anti-Markonikov fashion, anti-Markonikov regiochemistry, because they involve radical reactions, or when they involve radical reactions. So if you add a thiol to a double bond, this is a facile process as long as there's some sort of a radical initiator to get this reaction going. And so you can imagine some sort of a ra radical initiator that can homolyze to give radicals that very readily abstract um, these hydrogen atoms from thiols to give a thiol radical. And thiol radicals are very stable, unlike oxygen-based radicals. And so once you generate a thiol radical, that readily adds to the less substituted side of a CC double bond in order to give you the more stabilized, more substituted radical. And now this radical can abstract an H atom off of another thiol to regenerate the thiol radical and that continues the chain process. So thiol addition across double bonds is very facile. You can also add, as I said, HBr or HCl across double bonds in that manner. Okay, let's look at the, the kinetics for these types of reactions. And, and I want to talk about a simple uh, feature of radical reactions that has to do with concentrations. And what I want to do is I want to divide up the chain propagation steps from a set of steps that I didn't mention yet. And that is that there are always chain termination steps that are possible in radical reactions. And you want to outpace those chain termination steps. So for thiol addition, the chain propagation steps are addition of the thiol radical to the double bond. That makes a new carbon-based radical. And then that carbon-based radical pulls off an H atom from a thiol. And this step right here, this elementary reaction step, is proportional to the concentration of the thiol radical. If you have 10 times more thiol radical, that's going to be 10 times faster. This step over here, if you have 10 times more concentration of this carbon-based radical, then this will be 10 times faster. So the steps that are involved in propagation are first order. Right, there's a, a, it's first order, there's a, the a exponent to this thiol concentration is one. The exponent to this alkyl concentration is one. We say that those reactions are first order in the radical component. But when you look at the steps that kill radical reactions, and that's always a recombination event where two radicals get together. You don't want high concentrations of thiol radical because that causes these to simply dimerize and end the radical chain. Um, you don't want high concentrations of the carbon-based radical because that will cause those carbon radicals to dimerize together and kill the radical chain. And then the thiol radical can react with the carbon-based radical if the concentrations are high. And when you look at the rate laws for these steps, they have a second order dependence. 10 times more of this means 100 times faster dimerization. So the termination steps are second order in radical concentration. So if you keep if you lower the concentration of your radicals that are floating around in solution, yeah, you lower these steps, but you really lower the rates of the termination steps. And so what you want when you do radical chain reactions is you want to have reactions where the concentrations of the radicals stay low. Not so low that the reaction takes a century, but low enough where you don't have termination outcompeting your radical reactions. Okay, so if you work out the overall rate laws, if you sit down with a pen and paper and then back out the concentrations of your rate determining steps and relate them to the concentrations of the starting materials, you'll end up with these really bizarre rate laws that have fractional order dependence on concentration. So this is something you should expect if you're, if you're ever exposed to working out the full rate laws for radical chain reactions, as you can expect these rate laws that have weird concentration dependence, fractional order. Um, and we're not going to do that in this class, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to do that on the exam next week. But just expect this as a feature of radical kinetics, this fractional dependence uh, for radical chain reactions. Very common. Okay, let's come back to this idea of initiator. You have more of, an, of a choice than just benzoyl peroxide. So, <clears throat> peroxide, so benzoyl peroxide is a pretty common initiator for radical reactions. Just simple alkoxy radicals. Uh, where you don't have a pi system next door, you just have a, a carbon atom next door with no pi electrons incapable of resonance, those are pretty unstable. And you have to heat something like this pretty hot to get useful rates of radical generation. So if you look at the rate constants for these, this is a really slow homolytic process. And this is at 80 degrees as well. Um, when you have a capacity to have a resonance 
uh, group nearby, so you have the capacity for having a resonance acceptor and potentially a donor next door. Uh, you can see the ra rates are somewhere on the order of, of three orders of magnitude faster. And then in, in this case, this is a very common reagent for radical initiation called AIBN. It's a diazo compound, and this homolyzes in a two-step process, first to give one radical and then to give the other, in order to generate carbon radicals that float around and initiate your reaction. Um, this is a substantially faster homolysis process, and so as a result, you get to choose an initiator that matches the temperature of your reaction. So if you look at the temperatures required for a 10-hour half-life, um, if you're running your reactions at higher temperature, um, you want to use a radical initiator that matches that temperature. Whereas if you choose this very fast initiator down here, and you heat that to 125 degrees, your concentrations of radicals would be too high. So you want to choose the right initiator for your reaction. Not too fast, not too slow, um, and there are lists of these that you can access that will tell you the t kinds of temperatures you need for these types of radical initiators. Now all of these are, are examples of homolytic initiators where, the, where um, generally you heat them or else you have to add a photon or get the system to absorb a photon in order to homolyze the bond. We didn't talk about photochemistry this quarter, uh, but what if you want to do the reaction at room temperature, what do you do? So there's a very classical initiator that you use for, for room temperature reactions, and that's triethyl borane. Once you put a trialkyl borane into a flask, if you just lift the septum off just briefly and let a, a tinge of oxygen in there, you immediately initiate radical reactions. And so what happens is, remember, oxygen is a diradical, but it also has lone pairs. So the oxygen that you breathe has, has these electronegative oxygen atoms with lone pairs on there, and those can attack boron. You get a very small amount of these borate complexes in there. And this can now homolyze in order to make this oxygen happy. It's a way of giving this oxygen, a, um, it's a way of giving this oxygen an octet of electrons. And so the ethyl radical that you liberate can now go back. Remember, alkyl radicals react very rapidly with oxygen, so you now generate these alkyl peroxy radicals, and those can continue this process of adding to boron and liberating alkyl radicals until you've removed all the alkyl groups from your boron species. And this is fast at room temperature. No heating required. Just expose an alkyl borane to oxygen, and you're going to start having radicals uh, existing in your reaction. Here's an example where they've used triethyl borane and oxygen. As sometimes they don't write the oxygen there. It's just left for you to understand that they've exposed their reaction mixtures to oxygen. So here's a reaction of tin. So when you see tin hydrides added to a reaction, that means somebody wants to, to trap out their alkyl radical with a hydrogen atom. They want to cap off that radical with an H. So one classical way to remove halides uh, from al uh, from uh, from organic substrates and replace it with H, and I didn't draw the H here, um, is to add tributyl tin hydride. And you need some sort of a radical initiator to get that started. So in this particular case, they add triethyl borane. It generates an ethyl radical. Um, and that can easily abstract a hydrogen atom from uh, tributyl tin hydride. And so that generates a tin radical. And the tin radicals love to form tin halogen bonds. So the tin halogen bonds are, are, are relatively stable. So in this case, the overall thermodynamics of this is you're trading a very weak carbon iodine bond for a relatively stable tin iodine bond. It's this weak carbon iodine or carbon bromine bond that you're trading off in these reactions. So tin very readily abstracts an iodine atom, and that leaves your R dot, the radical here, to pull off a hydrogen atom from the tin again, and that's what, what leads to removal of the, of the halogen and replacement with a hydrogen atom. And if you look at the relative rates for abstraction here, it's related to the bond strength for these alkyl halides. Tin is, better at, is best at pulling off iodide, not quite so good at pulling bromine off of a carbon-bromine bond. That carbon-bromine bond is more stable. You can even pull off phenyl selenyl groups. You can pull off these full-scale functional groups where there's a carbon-oxygen bond. You can pull off chlorine, not quite as readily, um, but even thiophenyl groups. So tin radicals can add to and then, and then pull off each of these types of groups. It's a stepwise process for this. I'll talk about that momentarily. And then when you look at this next step, the reactivity of your alkyl radical affects how quickly it abstracts a hydrogen atom off the tin hydride. So the most reactive radicals, sp2 radicals, uh, will react fastest with tin hydrides, aryl radical. 
vinyl radical. You're never going to see a reaction with an alkynyl radical. Don't worry about that. Those are faster than regular alkyl radicals, and those are faster than resonance stabilized radicals like allyl or benzyl. Those are, those are relatively slow because the radicals are relatively stable. Okay, so halogens, tin hydride, whenever you see that, you can expect that you're going to have a new CH bond. And those reactions are very tricky because when you look at this product, it's not at all obvious where that new tin, where that new carbon H bond is because we don't draw hydrogens for organic molecules. Okay, so, uh, <clears throat> so carbon radicals can pull hydrogen atoms from tin hydride bonds, but can carbon radicals pull hydrogens from carbon hydrogen bonds? Can you get exchange? And if the system is set up correctly, you can, but it's not usually a very fast reaction. So here's a reaction where they're using, this is a tridyl protecting group, but this tridyl protecting group, triphenylmethyl, has a carbon bromine bond built into it. And so when you expose this to tin radicals, and they, they're using AIBN as a thermal initiator here, you generate small amounts of these tin radicals. And the tin radicals will abstract bromine to generate a very reactive phenyl radical. So sp2 hybridized radicals are unstable and reactive. And so that sp2 radical can abstract a hydrogen atom through an intramolecular process. That's what makes this possible. Otherwise, it would be too slow. Um, and that generates this, this stabilized oxygen next to oxygen radical. There's a lone pair on oxygen that stabilizes that. But it still splits apart to give a stable CO pi bond. You know that, that CO pi bonds are stable. So that's a driving force for release of this stabilized um, um, tridyl radical, which can then abstract a, a, a hydrogen from the tin hydride. Um, so if the system is set up right intramolecularly, you can get reasonable rates uh, of, of H atom transfer between carbon atoms, uh, which is usually very slow. Okay, here's a, a reaction that involves these carbon-sulfur double bonds. Whenever you see carbon-sulfur double bonds, you need to be thinking that this is nothing like a CO pi bond. CO pi bonds are strong, and carbon-sulfur, anything to a third row atom is going to be a weak pi bond. And so uh, here's a classical reaction for deoxygenation. It's a, it's a reaction sequence where if you have a hydroxyl group you don't want, one thing that you can do is deprotonate this and add it to carbon disulfide. And you'll get this adduct that's a thiocarbonate that you can then alkylate with methyl iodide. And so you get this, this type of a carbonate that's commonly called a xanthate ester. So these are very good at retroene reactions to generate double bonds. Um, but if you throw in a tin hydride source, then what you can observe happening is that the tin radical will add to this sulfur atom in order to generate a heavily resonance stabilized um, ketyl radical or thioketyl radical. So this radical is stabilized by oxygen lone pairs, by sulfur lone pairs, <clears throat> and it very rapidly homolyzes <clears throat> in order to cleave this carbon-oxygen bond because you want to form a stable CO pi bond, right? You always want to form stable CO pi bonds. And then the resulting radical, the, now that you've cleaved this carbon-oxygen bond, that carbon-based radical can now be trapped by the tin hydride. So whenever you see a, a, a carbon-sulfur double bond in tin hydride, you can expect that the tin will add to the sulfur atom of that carbon-sulfur double bond. So this is a very tricky mechanism for cleaving carbon-oxygen bonds, uh, which are otherwise not easy to cleave. I'm going to go ahead and skip past this. This is another version of a deoxygenation re reaction. And the only thing I'm going to point to is that when you look at this intermediate that they're generating here, this is called a Barton ester, you can see that there's a carbon-sulfur double bond and you know exactly what the tin is going to do in that case or the alkyl or some radical. Some radical is going to add to this carbon-sulfur double bond because the pi bond is weak homolytically and it's going to put a single electron right there. And if you follow through the mechanism, you can see why this is going to lead to decarboxylation um, because CO pi bonds in carbon dioxide are, are, are stable. Okay, I want to get to the meat here because I want to make sure we don't run out of time and I want to talk about cyclization of radicals. If you put a double bond in just the right place, a carbon radical can cyclize onto that double bond faster than, again, than it traps uh, with the tin hydride. So for example, if I poise a, a double bond very close to this radical so that this can add to that double bond, um, I can outpace the rate at which the hydride reagent will trap that. And so as long as this is fast, occurs quickly, this radical now doesn't have that option to cyclize anymore and that will now get trapped uh, by the tin hydride reagent. 
And so this is a very classical way to make five-membered rings. Every time you see a five-membered ring in some sort of organic structure, you can make that through some sort of a radical reaction. And these reactions work well for five-membered rings. You don't see this six endocyclization, um, just naming it according to Balden rules, even though this would be a more stable radical than the primary alkyl radical. Right? It's not the radical stability that determines which reaction is faster. Um, it's reaction trajectories here. And this is 50 times faster than the six endo case. And five-membered rings are special. They have just the right orientation of orbitals so that the five exo cyclization is 20 times faster than the six exo. And you need to be fast if you want to cyclize radicals. Because what happens if you're not fast? If you're not fast to cyclize, the hydride reagent is simply going to trap that out. So this is why you see five-membered rings are so specially suited for synthesis through radical cyclizations. Let's take an, a, a, just a very common example here where somebody is, is using a radical cyclization. This is part of a, a, a synthesis of, I think, citriovirodin, a natural product. <clears throat> and you can see they're, they're throwing in their classical radical recipe. AIBN is an initiator. Tin hydride is, is the capping agent to, to add hydrogen atoms. And so eventually you can see you're going to pull off a bromine atom to generate a, bro, a, a bromine substituted carbon radical. And that's poised right here next to this alkene. And so that very rapidly cyclizes. And then the radical that you get can trap, can, can pull a hydrogen atom off of the tin hydride. So it's kind of an obvious way to form a five, or maybe not so obvious way to make a, make a five-member drink. And I'm, I apologize, there's another bromine atom here that got removed by the tin hydride in, an, in another step. And I didn't show that. OK. so. Generally, when you see polycyclic structures with lots of five-membered rings, this is a really classical type of product that you could make through a radical cyclization. When you have five-membered rings all fused together. And so you can see what would happen here if you abstracted an iodine atom with a tin radical. You'll generate a phenyl radical that is poised to cyclize through that five-endo trig cyclization in order to make a new five-membered ring here. And the resulting radical that you get, because they've designed the system that way, is now set up so that it's poised right here, five atoms away from this carbon. So you can add to this next double bond. And now this radical that you generate at this position has no cyclizations left over. It's just going to sit there eventually until it collides with a tin hydride reagent. And that gives you um, this final ring system with the, the, the tin hydride hydrogen atom at this position. OK. so. Uh, Radical cyclizations, five-membered rings is what you need to think. Uh, that's pretty much it for the radical stuff. And I want to try to summarize what we've done for this quarter in this class. And what do you need to do with Chem 201 and reaction mechanism stuff as you go forward? What do we expect you to do? Uh, when you go into the lab and you do reactions, you'll be confronted with situations where you want to know, will my reactions work? Or won't they work? Or why isn't my reaction working? And it almost always boils down to some sort of a competitive process. It's not that reactions don't go. You can always heat reactions up to make them go. The problem is when you heat them, there's competitive side reactions. And so what really matters to you in the lab is not just whether reactions are fast. It's are they faster than the other possibilities. So here's a simple case where you can ask, gee, am I going to get this Diels-Alder reaction? And what you have to worry about in this case is not whether the Diels-Alder reaction can occur. It's whether that Diels-Alder reaction with this alkyne is faster than Diels-Alder reaction with itself and dimerization. And how do you assess stuff like that? How do you think about this ahead of time or after you're rummaging through the debris of your reaction products to try to figure out what happened? Right? There's always some sort of an issue where you're worried about selectivity. There's some intermediate that has two choices. And you want to identify those choices and figure out what's faster. Because that's what's going to determine the ratio of products you want versus junk you don't want. And you know how to set up rate equations to think about that. In this particular case, uh, <clears throat> the rate for formation of the product you want is proportional to the concentration of the diene times the concentration of the dienophile. Whereas the dim dimerization reaction is, is, has a second order dependence on the diene. If you drop the concentration of diene by a factor of 10, this is 10 times slower. But this will be 100 times slower. You can use concentration to win in your reactions if you understand reaction kinetics. But there's a deeper way to think about organic chemistry. That's how you started off in Chem 201. So if you look at these rate constants, you have the capacity to think about rate constants. 
Where do rate constants come from? They're related to this equation where the rate constants are related to the free energy barriers for deals alder versus homodimerization deals alder. Right? And how do you think about this stuff? Well, you know how to think about the energies of transition states and ground states. This, this goes back to things like enthalpy and entropy. Enthalpy was all that stuff we talked about. I said every reaction I, I ask you to explain, I want you to explain whether this is good or bad in terms of charge, sterics, or MO interactions. That's arrow pushing, right? You think about rates of reactions by thinking about these three things, and mainly arrow pushing in organic chemistry. Entropy is a lot harder. That has to do with you envisioning the number of potential transition states, conformations, orientations in the transition state versus in the ground state. A lot harder to think about entropy, but it's still possible. So we've talked about all of the tools that you need to think about your organic reactions. We've talked about concentration dependence. We've talked about rate constants and their relation to energy differences. And we've talked about how to think about those two types of energy differences, entropic, um, and in terms of all these common things, charge, electrostatics, sterics, I think everybody knows, and then finally arrow pushing, which is very powerful. And moreover, this quarter, you have tools now um, to use computers to help you think about these things and model them. So in our last discussion section, we had a chance uh, to use comp uh, simple computer programs to model uh, the rates of chemical reactions uh, on the reaction course. Uh, we've used ab initio calculations to be able to calculate what MOs look like. What are the energies of the molecular orbitals? So you can predict things like um, uh, regiochemistry and deals alder reactions and predict relative rates of regioisomer formation. Okay, so uh, that's all for the quarter. And uh, we have an exam on Wednesday, and I'll see you guys on Wednesday. And I'm moving my office hours to Tuesday, and I'll tell you guys when I'm going to move my office hours to.